Hello and welcome everyone to this Pearson English webinar. Thank you for joining us. Please remember this session is recorded and the recording will be made available via our YouTube channel after the event. Also, every participant will receive a certificate of attendance. Please submit any questions you have in the chat box and we'll answer these at the end of the session. Without further delay, I am excited to hand over to Kasha, who's going to tell us about blended learning for young learners. Over to you, Kasha. Hello, and, and very nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Kasha Yanitz Delaru, and I'll be running this webinar today about blended learning um, for young learners. And it's lovely to see how many different countries um, are saying hello to us keep them coming. I was um, assuming that because it's the afternoon, we might my, my afternoon in the UK, of course, I was assuming that we would have a, a lot of people joining us from um, South America. And we do indeed have um, Argentina and Ecuador, I, I saw there, but there's lots also from um, Europe still, and even Asia, that must be quite late for you all. So it's really lovely to see um, such a wide range of countries and also really lovely to see how confident you all are with using um, chat. Um, that's great because hopefully you'll be able to, to comment throughout the session and, and, and ask questions or share your own experiences. And that's going to be great. Okay, so um, today's uh, session is, uh, as you know, about blended or hybrid learning for young learners. And this is what I would like us to look at today. Uh, so first of all, to do a little bit of thinking about how we decide what we want to achieve, uh, and then what tools we can use to achieve what we want to achieve, and then how we can check that we are achieving it. And finally, I would like us to have um, a, a little bit of time for, for thinking about how we can make sure that students have a sense of belonging, because that's also a very important aspect um, of teaching at the moment. Before we dive into this uh, topic, um, I'd just like to get our definitions out of the way because I, I kind of I'm kind of hesitating. Are we talking about hybrid learning or are we talking about blended learning? Hybrid hybrid teaching, in fact, because we are talking to teachers, um, is uh, when some of our students are in class and some are not. So it's um, we are adjusting our type, our our approach to teaching based on where our students are. Whereas with blended learning or blended teaching, we're using a mix of print and digital components, trying to use them to their best purpose for teaching because all of our learners are um, either in the class or at home and we're, we're focusing on how how to use the components to their best effect rather than how to address the fact that students might be in different locations but really it is quite useful I think to look at them combined because there are so many different scenarios um, around the world at the moment with some schools open uh, some schools closed and some schools open, but with some students uh, from time to time having to self-isolate and join from home. And therefore, um, they, they do sort of merge at the moment. And if the school is still open and you are able to use blended learning, that is also excellent preparation for the moment when you might have to switch to hybrid um, teaching. So I would like to look at both of these scenarios sort of together. Um, I should not forget to click. Um, so let's uh, start by trying to think um, what it is that we want to achieve uh, with our students. Um, the first thing uh, to think about is that really hybrid teaching is not the same as face-to-face -face teaching. Um, we all know that some of the students do um, sort of disappear from the radar when schools close. Um, and uh, UNESCO estimates that around 69% uh, of students are reached by remote teaching. So um, that is quite a large proportion of, of students not um, getting any education when schools close. And um, if you're teaching young learners online, uh, then you know that it is also not so easy um, to address all the issues that you would normally find quite easily addressable in the classroom. It just is, isn't exactly the same, and it's a fact. 
Um, and therefore, it may make sense to adjust expectations a little bit. Um, and it may depend on your teaching situation, of course, because some countries have already decided um, for teachers whether the curriculum is going to be slightly adjusted um, at the moment during the pandemic or whether the curriculum stays the same. And you may not always be in the position to decide um, on the curriculum that you need to teach this year. Um, but it is a, if you can, it is a good, a good thing to, to contemplate. Um, because uh, especially with young learners, um, they might not be able to uh, absorb quite as much as they would if you were teaching um, face to face. And if you're thinking about what your priorities are, uh, it might be um, it might make sense also to contemplate um, in the context, contemplate this in the context of the school closure. So sometimes we know, uh, insofar as we know anything at the moment, that the school will be closed for two weeks or a month because we're told by the government that this is the case. And if you have this sort of um, short period of time ahead of you when the, when the school is closed, you can plan to spend this time, for example, focusing on um, vocabulary and, and reading and, and, and writing and listening activities that you can um, set as sort of homework for students to do in their own time. Um, knowing that you will then return to school, well, knowing as far as, again, as far as we can know anything, that you will then return to school and you can catch up on speaking um, uh, afterwards. Um, but perhaps you want, you, you do know that it may take longer and you want to plan differently and, and you want to focus on addressing communication mostly uh, while you're teaching online. And uh, you do know that you will go through less material, but you want to focus on communication anyway. So there are different ways you can look at this. Um, but either way, it is not an easy choice, obviously, but it is worth thinking about this, um, depending on your circumstances, to try and come up with some kind of a plan of what it is um, that you want to achieve, ideally a, a more or less realistic plan, if you can, of, of what it is that you want to achieve, because if you have a goal set, it's always easier to meet that goal. Um, so that's deciding what you want to achieve, uh, which I appreciate you don't always have full um, decision-making powers uh, to do. And um, let us um, have a look at um, how you might want to achieve what you decide to achieve. And I would like us to start with a little poll. Um, Charlie will help me with this. These are the questions that you will see in a second. And please click uh, to respond, uh, which is true in your case. You teach face-to-face, -face, you teach live lessons, you only send students materials to cover in their own time, or you do a mix of things at the moment. At about 50% uh, there, Kasha. Um, okay. Uh, Shall we have a look? Yeah, a, yes, let's have a look. And voting and share results. Oh, we have 60%. 60% jumped up in the last moment. Uh, excellent. So, okay, 9% teach face-to-face, -face, which is not a huge percentage. 23% teach live lessons online. And only 2% rely only on sending materials to cover in students on, on time. 25% do a mix. So that's quite a high percentage, isn't it, for, um, for online teaching? OK, that's excellent. That's very, very interesting. Shall we go back to the presentation, please? Thank you. Um, 
Let's have a look at this slide. This is this comes from a survey done by UNESCO, UNICEF, and World Bank combined, showing how teachers teach in various segments at the moment. I'll um, tell you a little bit about the colors because I appreciate you're probably looking at this off on fairly small screens. So um, we have pre-primary on the left and then primary. And the dark blue is take home paper-based materials. The pale blue we can ignore because that's the television and radio broadcasting, so not something you do personally. And then the dark gray is mobile phone and pale gray is online. So you can see that the use of online um, is, is, is higher than the use of paper-based activity, which uh, you confirmed in your poll, although in your poll you're far more reliant on online um, than, um, than in this investigation. Um, so that's, um, that's excellent, really, um, that you are able to do that. Um, if you are thinking about uh, doing uh, teaching via uh, video conferencing and are not yet doing that, um, then it might make sense um, to think about what preparation might make might work uh, in this case. Online learning is, of course, slightly more self-directed, and even students aged ten or twelve might uh, struggle without um, your help and might rely on parental help. Um, there are all sorts of skills that um, they would need, which they which might be um, new to them. So it is worth considering whether you can rely on the parents here. Um, have you got a way of contacting them easily? Will they want to help? Um, and it is likely that the answer to at least one of these questions is no. And um, in which case, I think this is a good time, uh, if you're still uh, teaching face-to-face, -to, -face, to try and reach as many parents um, uh, as you can. Um, there might be a way of, um, of accessing, accessing them via the school. Of course, parents might be very busy um, and uh, they might have more than one child uh, uh, who, uh, who is young and needs help. So it is very helpful to send them very, very clear, very succinct information. Um, and rather than bombard them with, with numerous messages, just send them one very short, very clear message about what you want to do, how you want to do it, and when you want to do it, outlining methods of communication and times and deadlines and expectations. Um, it may not work, of course. It is quite possible that you will not be able to reach all the parents, but it is worth trying and it is worth making it easy for them um, to, to help you as well. Keep it simple um, is, is, is the bottom line. Um, and the next question that is worth considering is uh, are students able to log on to the platform that you're using? I know that a lot of you will be using school platforms. You might also be using platforms that come with the courseware like our Pearson English portal. Um, if you know that you cannot rely on parental um, help, you might be able to uh, onboard students yourself. Um, and it might be a good idea to practice with students while they are still at school, if you, or if you can contact them, uh, logging onto the platform and making sure that they understand what they're doing then. Um, another thing that, of course, it is, is worth checking is whether students would be able to hold a meeting in real time using either Teams or Zoom or some other tool that your school is using. Um, and also, whether they are able to send you their homework. Um, and again, worth establishing how this homework might be sent, um, whether uh, to your email, to a school platform, as a screenshot using their mobile phone. Um, if you are still at school, it's a good idea to try and practice this still at school so that you know that some methods work better than others and then you can um, use these methods that work particularly well. Um, it will be easier when you have these routines um, established. Um, another good idea, of course, is to create um, online lesson rules. Um, and um, you may have already created online lesson rules before um, earlier in the year, but it's maybe a good idea to revisit these and 
um, and see if you want to add any after your earlier experiences. I have added some, some of the most obvious um, online rules um, that most people go for. So joining on time and, and dressing like you would to school and, and having everything ready. Um, but um, you might also want to add other things about noise, uh, perhaps, or about uh, light and being able to see the face of the student, or being sensitive, of course, because not everybody has very good um, a very good situation at home to be able to set things up. Um, um, so uh, you might want to add lots more about ways of communicating and what other things you would like to um, students to prepare. And it's a good idea, of course, to have a dry run, to have a bit of a practice at school. If you can, if you're lucky to have a computer classroom, you can just try and have a, 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 an online lesson with students of this type. Uh, and, and really be prepared and make sure everybody knows what they're doing. Um, all of these skills help, will help students um, um, to, to, to work with you later if the school is, gets closed. Okay, if you are able to hold online lessons and, and you have access to the Pearson English portal, uh, which, which um, now comes with all the recently published uh, Pearson courses for primary. You will be pleased to hear that uh, Pearson English Portal is now linked to Zoom. And um, like in the past, when you logged in, you had two tabs there. One was called Products and one was called Classes. You can probably see them on my slide. Now we also have a third tab. Um, and that is uh, one which which has the calendar and Zoom uh, linked to it. Uh, so you need to set up your own uh, Zoom account. But once you have that, you can set up scheduled classes and add them to the calendar. And then all of your students um, in in the class that you have set up will get scheduled uh, will get notifications of this scheduled class, so they will not miss it. Hopefully. And then you can use Zoom straight from the portal, which, um, which makes it easier uh, to, to share the presentation tool and, and the resources. Um, and um, as I said, every primary course published recently um, by us does have access to the Pearson English portal. And on the Pearson English portal, uh, you can um, find the presentation tool, which is the screenshot on the left. Um, and that includes all the pages of the print book, plus audio, plus video, plus interactive activities. So it's really all you need to present in the class. And, um, and you can present it online, obviously, just as you would uh, using a projector or an interactive whiteboard in a face-to-face -face situation. Uh, and you also have access to uh, resources, which is the second screenshot you can see there in the middle. And these resources include such things as audio, assessment, video, additional games, um, also uh, digital versions of posters and, and flashcards. So you really do have all the resources you might need to teach in, in one place. And um, we have also provided teachers and students with ebooks now in case the print books get left behind you know, get left behind at school. So we have those as well. So as you can see, Pearson English Portal does make it a little bit easier for you to, 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 um, to teach online because you have all the tools in one place. And, and we're continuing to work on improving it. So it is a good experience for you. Um, it, and if you are teaching online, it's, it's a good resource to be able to, to rely on. However, uh, you might not always be able to reach all the students um, with uh, online uh, live lessons. Um, obviously, um, there are some parents who will not be able to help children set up. Some children may not have good enough internet or um, enough equipment around to go around the whole family. So in these cases, there are sort of two simple avenues um, which you can follow. One is to hold live lessons with those who can join but record them and then send them to those kids who couldn't participate, send the recordings, the links. And another um, possible avenue is um, if you're preparing a slide deck rather than using a presentation tool, you can send this um, deck 
to the children who cannot participate. In both of these cases, of course, and um, the, 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 it's not quite the same to be going through the, um, uh, a video of, of a lesson. Um, it's not quite the same level of engagement for the child, especially if the child is quite young. So it is important to support this with um, additional teacher-student communication so, uh, so that the child does feel this connection um, and this contact with the teacher. Um, okay, the next thing that I would like us to look at is how we can check that what we are teaching, how we are teaching, if, if the students are learning, are they really doing anything there? Um, thinking about online lessons, uh, teachers really need to keep students on mute most of the time because otherwise they wouldn't be able to run the lesson, let's be honest. So. Um, the, the usual sort of opportunities for contact, interaction and feedback are vastly reduced. You, you do not hear the sort of usual chatter. Students cannot find questions quite, ask questions quite so easily as they would in the classroom. Um, you cannot walk around the classroom to see what they're doing exactly. Uh, and you cannot sort of um, provide feedback all the time. Um, so, it's a good idea to think about how we can uh, keep them engaged and how we can keep an eye on what they're doing, even if they are working online. And, and one simple solution to that is e exactly that, keeping them engaged with um, a constant, constant uh, questioning, basically. Uh, it's a good idea because they can't speak so easily. Uh, all at once. It's a good idea to establish a non-verbal system of communication, which could be um, asking students to create cards with a red and green light for yes and no. It could also be, um, um, I can see a comment that um, some somebody cannot hear me anymore. Is this a general um, issue or is this a sort of individual issue? I'm hearing you loud and clear, Kasia, uh, quite clearly as well. Okay. Yes, I can. Yeah, other people are saying that they can uh, hear, so that's okay. I will continue, and hopefully, the people who have issues will be able to sort them out. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, um, establish a nonverbal way of communicating with the students. So, if they have cards uh, on which they have like traffic light system, green light, red light, and they can say yes or no to you, then you can ask them questions frequently and, and they will respond. That will keep them engaged and you will know what they're doing. You could also ask them, even better, to respond to your questions with uh, standing up, raising their hands. This gives them a little bit of movement, which is also key. And obviously when we are not going to school, the, our movement is limited around the house. So a good idea to add a little bit of movement and again, keeps them engaged. And if you keep asking for feedback and you, you see them giving you this feedback in this nonverbal way, you know that they are doing what they're doing. You know that they are with you and it helps them keep engaged. So that's a good idea and you can establish your own routines and your own systems and, and then you can add to these systems, of course, and, and vary them as well to, to have some fun and, 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 and some movement. Um, so that's one idea to, to keep, um, to keep uh, checking on them. Um, another way of checking on them is, of course, to ask them to show their work, um, just show in, in their little screens. And, and you might not be able to see very much, but you will be able to see that they are doing something and you will be able um, to see that they are engaged and that they are still with you and they haven't drifted off. So that is also useful. Um, you can also use student surroundings and your own surroundings. And this is the benefit of working from home. Um, like in the past, you would need to, to drag this huge bag of objects to school to show them various things um, and teach them various new items of vocabulary. Now you have them all around you. You have lots of colors around you. You have the inside of the house around you. You have toys around you. Students have toys around um, and food items. So it's a lot easier and you can bring all of these realia maybe a little bit easier and students can, of course, with some sensitivity as to their domestic situation. But that's another, um, another good approach of, of sort of benefiting from the situation. Um, and um, they generally just set small tasks frequently um, so they can respond um, 
in a visual or visible way. Um, and, and of course, I mentioned the traffic light system and movement, and, and you're commenting here sensibly that we also need, uh, we can also use chat. And of course, this is true. Not all the students, the little ones, might not be able to type. But as soon as they can type, it's it's a fantastic idea, of course, to use chat and, and, and seeing how, um, how comfortable you're feeling with using chat. I'm sure you are encouraging your students to use the chat function as well. And, and that is brilliant because you see what is happening um, and you can run your lesson. Um, it is, of course, a good idea to also have some uh, rules for using chat because you don't want students to start chatting uh, too much uh, among themselves in their own language. You, you, you want them to, to stick more or less to the topic and to the language you're trying to teach. Um, but that is good as well. So um, small visible outputs frequent and simple um, help you keep this engagement and help you keep um, checking in on students and seeing what it is that they are doing. Visible outputs frequently is, is I suppose, the, the, the key to, to success here. Um, OK. Um, moving on. Another way you can see um, whether students are um, doing their work Again, if you're using Pearson English Portal, uh, you can use assignable activities that we provide with our more recently published courses. Um, once you assign these activities to the students, the activities will appear in the homework area of student site, uh, which I have highlighted with a, a little red um, oval. And then the students can do these activities. And once they are completed, they will um, appear in your grade book. And uh, when you look at um, the grade book, you can see how well your students have done individually and also how well they have done uh, as a group. You will be able to see also how much time they have spent on the task and how many uh, times they have attempted the task to get to the, uh, to the level that they got to in the end. So it's, it's quite a useful um, tool. You can also um, go by skill. Um, and, and then um, you can see how they're doing it vocabulary versus how they're doing it at reading, for example. Um, <clears throat> so that also allows you to follow how they are doing um, at school, uh, at, at their learning. Um, another thing that you can do, of course, which I'm sure um, a lot of you are doing, is simply ask for, for, for work to be submitted to you. The, the final piece of um, work, the output, uh, could be submitted onto a school platform or via email or as a screenshot. Um, if you can rely on parental support or if students are slightly older, they can do it themselves. Um, it's useful to, as I said earlier, to establish um, a, a channel of communication that really works for everyone and then rely on this one channel of communication um, so that everybody knows what is expected um, every single time and, and students and parents are not lost as to how, how you would like this um, final piece of work to be delivered. Um, Another approach could be to ask for answers or ideas to be fed, uh, fed into a shared document. There are many tools now available, and I'm sure a lot of you are using some. Um, um, any shared document will do in this case, um, uh, where students can um, add their ideas or their answers um, at the same time. Um, what you see here is a screenshot of um, a whiteboard from Teams. Um, so Teams um, ha have, has this um, functionality, um, but you can equally use uh, a shared document on the Google Drive. Um, you can ask students then to, for example, um, in this case, add more vocabulary to these categories, um, for example. And you can see students uh, work um, in real life and you can see how they are typing. And it's fun for them as well to work together in, in this way. Um, as always, uh, give very clear instructions um, and very simple instructions um, to students. Um, as, as ever, that, well, that's always very helpful. Yeah. Um, 
And of course, you can ask for work to be presented in, in an online uh, class. Um, I would like to suggest that for this, you might also want to use uh, the resources available with your course. Um, quite often with a lot of courses, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of additional resources such as videos or games that students can do at home. And you can ask them to do these activities at home, but then um, ask them some very simple questions to go with these activities um, so that students can report back on how they have done and what they have done and so that you can see that they have in, indeed done the work. So, for example, in this case, um, this is a video about a weather experiment. So you can just ask them what weather experiment was shown in the in the video and then they will come back and they will hopefully be able to tell you. Uh, and similarly with the games, you can vocabulary games, you can ask them um, what new words did you learn or what is your new favorite word? Um, and, and they will come with a word and you will know that they have done the activity. It's, it's a kind of light touch flipped classroom approach that you could try with them. This means that they will do some of the work at home and you can devote more of the uh, of the lesson of the on, on, on the online lesson to do other things and, and to maybe um, fit in some more speaking activities, um, which are always something that you would want to add to your lesson. Similarly, of course, in a very simple way, um, you can just add ask students to to show their own artwork projects um, um, and present that in the class. And that would also work beautifully, of course. And that's something that um, will be very familiar with uh, to them after years of um, going to school and presenting their artwork in class. However, in some cases, um, we might just have to accept that you do not actually have visibility of whether students are doing any work and if parents are able to pass on, oh, some magic is happening. Uh, I'll go back to the slide that I want to be in. Um, you might not um, have any visibility of what they are doing and you might not have a way of checking that parents are passing um, any information from you to the students. Um, you might just not know if they're doing anything or not. Um, it is still worth trying. Um, and it is true that some parents might just be juggling too much. They might have many young learners at home and they might be working as well and they might not be able to keep up with the communication. Um, but if you provide them with very clear instructions and links and suggestions, they might be able to fit them in somewhere. So it is still a good idea to keep trying and to be very clear um, in what you're suggesting um, and, and to, to suggest new things to them. What I'm showing you on this slide is some activities that you might find in um, the Primary Academy. Primary Academy is... Um, uh, uh, and what you would get with any Pearson primary course uh, that has Pearson English platform that also gives access to the primary academy and and primary academy includes lots of additional resources for teachers to use in the class but also some to use um, with to, to suggest and send to parents um, so as you, as you can see there's lots of different um, tiles with different resources in the primary academy and what I'm showing here is a partic particularly fun game um, and there are seven, seven games like this. It's, it's a game with a mission so students um, need to find a cat but in order to find this cat they have to go through a fairly lengthy process of um, searching through all of these rooms in the house and on the way, they are asked an awful lot of questions. Um, there are listening activities, vocabulary activities, um, and, and they, there are three levels and, and students can also see how they are doing against other players. So it's quite an engaging and fun, fun game and, and students do have then access to some learning and, and are uh, exposed to, to English. There, as I said, there are seven of these games um, and um, um, the Primary Academy, uh, uh, contains also um, a learn at home uh, section, which has um, 18 packs uh, related to the usual primary topics. And, and they are sort of sets of activities which might make it easier for you to send material to students because they are kind of ready made. Um, so there are some activities that you can uh, send to, to parents, suggest to parents, which are fun activities, and you can hope that students will be doing them um, but um, 
you know, you, you might not really be sure whether they're doing them or not, um, still worth trying. Um, and um, the last but very important part um, of, of my presentation I would like to have a look at is um, how to make sure that students have a sense of belonging. Um, this is difficult, uh, of course, because as I mentioned at the beginning of, of our meeting, um, interaction, both students uh, among themselves and also student teacher is, is really what is suffering most um, during uh, school closures and, um, and online teaching. And most of the video conferencing tools make it quite difficult to communicate in a free way. If more than one person speaks, then nobody can understand what is being said. So in, in a primary classroom, most of the time, um, only the teacher can speak. And, and, and we have mentioned um, uh, the, the, the chat as, as, as a good way of communicating and keeping this connection going. Um, and we have mentioned other nonverbal ways of communicating. But it is a very good idea and important to leave some space um, for unstructured communication, if you can, at the beginning of every lesson, and just a, an, an informal chat, uh, if at all possible, um, to keep this sense of belonging. Um, also very important, although I appreciate quite difficult, to make sure all students continue to feel part of the class. Um, and, and to consider those who are absent and try and come up with ideas that would help them feel part of the class, even if they cannot attend all the lessons. Um, and one way of organizing this is to refer to these collaborative spaces, which I mentioned uh, previously as an idea for, for use during an online class. If you're streaming a live class, you can uh, type your uh, students, you can encourage students to type their responses in the chat and you can use these boards as I, as, as I mentioned earlier. But even if some of the students are not uh, able to join a live class, you might still want to use these um, uh, collaborative spaces for them so that students who can join live lessons and those who cannot can still work together on some projects and can feed their ideas and brainstorm um, before or after the lessons together so that they have as much chance as it's possible um, to work together um, while teaching cannot happen face to face. Um, oi. You may also want to try and come up with ideas for mini projects that students um, can do, uh, even if they don't have great access to the internet. Maybe there are ways that they can communicate among themselves and, and, and work on some ideas together um, and do activities, as I mentioned, that can be done at any time of the day and not at the moment of a live class feeding into um, a shared PowerPoint or a shared deck. Uh, of some sort. And it is a good idea to also encourage peer feedback so that they feel this additional communication uh, within the group. Always good, of course, if you provide them a checklist of what they are looking at um, when they are looking at other people's online projects, for example, um, that uh, allows them to be fair and kind in their, in their judgments if they have a checklist that they can just uh, check against and 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 comment on what you want them to appreciate. Um, that is helpful uh, also. Um, it is really try hard, quite hard to try and make and feel all the students connected if some of them are joining live classes and some of them are not, and um, some are offline and some have completely disappeared. But I just want to stress that it is important to keep trying. It is worth trying. And, and, and um, even if you can't reach them all, it's good to make an effort. Um, in summary, um, I would like to say that there are, of course, lots of different options now. Um, and I walked you through all sorts of possible tools on the Pearson English platform. But of course, there are also other sites and other tools that you can find. Um, and a lot of you have been sharing uh, some ideas, as I could see as I was talking. Um, so just 
choose what works for you. And, and I would really encourage you to sort of choose a few tools that you think really are effective and keep it simple. The, the students are still very young and they do need uh, clarity and, and parents are very busy and they also need simplicity and clarity. So if you decide on a few tools that work for you and work for the class, um, practice them, try them out, see that they work and, and stick to those tools. And similarly, stick to the rules that you have established, trying to make sure that everything is simple and streamlined as, as, as possible. Um, and finally, do remember about students' well-being. It, it, is, it is also an important part uh, of, of teaching at the moment. And uh, of course, it is important for all of us to catch up on the curriculum and make sure that the uh, differences between students are evened out and so on. But it is also important that students feel OK. Um, the situation is hopefully temporary and it will pass. So their, their well-being is as important as their education. It is a part of their education after all. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in. Uh, I'm sure Charlie has kept an eye on um, what other questions have been in, asked in the crowd. Yes, I have. Uh, Kasia, we've got five great questions already. OK. Fantastic. So. Um, uh, please, guys, do send uh, send more in as you wish, but we probably have to cap it at five. So, Kasia, the first one. Um, many students don't like their parents to be involved in their process of learning. What can you say about this, and how can we encourage a positive parent-student attitude? This is, of course, an interesting question. I think um, it, it's probably more of an issue the older the students are, uh, because with the youngest students, uh, quite often um, the, the parental help is, is indispensable. And we do communicate with parents rather than students when students are really small. When they are big enough to find, um, to find it uh, more appealing to work independently, I think it is a good idea to encourage this independent work um, but I would still keep parents in the loop um, because it is good to, to have parents uh, involved, even if they are not uh, directly involved. You might want in such cases to try and communicate directly to students and, and then explain to parents that the students are getting to the stage when they are ready to be a little bit more um, independent and more sort of responsible for their own learning, which is a good goal to have. Um, and that uh, it is advisable to sort of let them be responsible for their own learning and try and help them by explaining um, to the parents that it is a good process for students and, and a natural process for students to want to be responsible for their own learning. Great, thank you, Kasia. Uh, we got one here uh, regarding feedback and uh, checking uh, home assignments. So do you have any advice uh, for methods of giving feedback and checking home assignments uh, while developing writing skills in primary classes. This so is a, a big topic, of course, in itself. And mm. um, I think it's good to tell students clearly what you're expecting. I think in particular with writing, um, sometimes the difficulty is that um, students don't know what the ideal outcome might be. And it is very helpful for them to see an ideal piece of writing that they are trying to sort of achieve. Um, so if you're talking about, I don't know, writing some particular, I, I don't know, a little story or a little paragraph about something, it's good to show them an example and to discuss with them what it is that you're looking for. So that you're looking, for example, for a particular length of the text, that you're looking for use of particular structures, that you are looking for a complete answer to the task. And if they know what you're looking for, it will be easier for them to get there. I think that's that's the key thing. Um, tell them what you're looking for and then uh, evaluate on what, you're, what you've told them. Brilliant, thank you for that. Uh, another skills-based question here, now looking at speaking. Uh, what about developing students' speaking ability? We know that now students are learning from home and for the students who are not speaking English in everyday, uh, in their everyday communication, how can we encourage them to practice their speaking outside of the classes? 
Yes, this is a this is a struggle, um, and I don't know that I have an ideal answer to this. Um, and and this is why I said at the beginning that you might want to consider what you want to focus on, because if you would like to focus on speaking during the the um, the live lesson that you're teaching, this will probably eat most of your live lesson because for students to talk is time consuming. Um, it's also a little bit tricky for them to be speaking together in pairs or groups during a live lesson, because even if you put them into breakout rooms, you can't be in all the breakout rooms at the same time to help them. So it either needs to be sort of you and a student speaking in the lesson, or it, it's, it's, it's really difficult to set up. Um, so one way might unfortunately be that speaking is a little bit more limited. Um, and then you, when you return to school, you, you focus on speaking and communication in particular. Um, it is a difficult one because even if you try and set them up into pairs or groups to do a speaking activities together, you can't really be there with them to help them and to, to, to assist them if they need your help. Um, so, yes, it, it is a difficult question, that. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we've got two more in, but we've only got time for one. So I'm just trying to choose the most poignant um, and I hope I choose, um, I choose the one that's most suitable. So, do you have any tips um, for warming up at the beginning of a lesson when teaching online? Or are there any tools that we provide which can be used as warm-up exercises uh, for online classes? Um. I think a lot of in in real life uh, in real life classes, um, a lot of teachers uh, like to start with the use of flashcards, um, and and flashcards are available, so you can use that still. Um, so there are some tools which are, I mean, online flashcards are, are available, but of course you may have your own paper flashcards at home, so you might still want to do that. Um, and that is, an, um, um, of course, using flashcards is always a great idea with young learners, not only for warm up in the sense of vocabulary revision and, and getting into the, the spirit of learning English, but also in quite physical warm up because you can give them um, tasks which will require a little bit of movement, uh, which is great. So that's always a possibility. Um, other than that, I think a, a lot of the sort of warm ups that we suggest in teachers' books. Um, might work actually because there's quite a lot of warm-ups which relate to the previous lesson and which are quite teacher-led. So I think um, it's a good idea to look at your own uh, old teacher's book that you know well and 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 have a have a look at, at what might actually work online. And a lot of stuff might. Uh, there's some, some ideas um, here that somebody says yes. Barbara says or Simon says exactly. Games work very well. And a lot of these very simple games with movements do work online because you can see students in their little rectangles moving about and that, that works. Lots of new ideas coming up as well. Excellent. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Kasia. Uh, we're, at, we're at time now. So, Kasia, thank you so much for delivering another great uh, webinar this week. Um, uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us um, and, and have a lovely rest of the uh, day. Thank you. Fantastic. And just a quick note to confirm that a recording of the webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming days uh, and certificates will be sent out to everybody. Uh, that is, to come, I see some of the questions here, that is a certificate per webinar. Uh, for each webinar you attend, you will receive a certificate. Um, we are also uh, aware of the uh, current issue with the certificate system, so please bear with us while uh, we resolve this issue. Uh, and as soon as it is resolved, you will receive uh, a new link to your uh, certificates. So thanks very much for your time, and please join us at another Pearson English webinar soon. Have a good day.